we begin our series on a light to the Gentiles, and this is a fascinating study. And I think a very important one, and one that I certainly, over the years, have delighted in, because it shows the wonderful mercy of our God. In the falling aside of his people Israel, he understood from the very beginning that he would turn to the Gentiles and develop what is called by our Lord Jesus Christ a nation. And we'll come to that passage later on in our studies, God willing. But here we have, brothers and sisters, the matter of our call to the truth. From the times of the apostles down to today, Yahweh has been calling a people out of the Gentiles for his name. And we are privileged to be in that position. So let's rejoice in that today as we see the way that his hand has worked in the past. In Acts chapter 13, the apostle Paul with Barnabas was in Antioch in Pisidia. As he did always, he went into the synagogue first and there he preached. But as he went on preaching, the Jews became more and more agitated with the things he was saying. And finally, there were many Gentiles who were gathering around the synagogue and saying, we too would want to hear these things. So the Apostle Paul preached to them. We read this in verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. They'd done that. But the Jews became very agitated. The record says they, they were moved with envy and with hatred for the fact that the Gentiles were hearkening to the things that Paul was preaching. And so there was a big ruckus that went on there in Antioch. And the Apostle Paul said this, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And then he does something quite remarkable. He arrogates to himself and Barnabas, <coughs> Isaiah 49 verse 6. Now you and I wouldn't have the temerity to do this, but the Apostle Paul does. For he goes on to say this in verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, and here's the quotation from Isaiah 49, verse 6, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Now we all know that that prophecy is about our Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul arrogates it to himself and Barnabas. Incredible, isn't it? Not really, because he was Christ's representative to the Gentiles, the apostle to the Gentiles. And we read this in verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, there's good reason for us to be glad, brothers and sisters, because of the wonderful things that have been revealed to us in the Abrahamic promises that have been taught from the days of the apostles and will go on being taught until Christ comes. <coughs> That is the status, the position in which we find ourselves today. A wonderful blessing from our God. Now several weeks ago we gave a class here in this hall on Isaiah 54 and 55, its connections with John chapter 6. So I'm not going to go through all of the details that I did on that occasion, but I think it's necessary, because many of you weren't here, just to have a brief look at this matter of God developing the ecclesia out of both faithful Jew and Gentile. We come back to Isaiah 49 where this passage is quoted from by the Apostle Paul. He quotes Isaiah 49 verse 6. We want to pick up the story here in Isaiah 49 from verse 18. Now I say again it would be impossible for me to say many, much more than about five or ten minutes worth because we wouldn't get to the family of Caleb. We did any more than that. So let's just see if we can paint this picture from Isaiah 49. There's the quote in verse 6 that you can see with your own eyes. And then we come to verse 18. Lift up thine eyes round about, and behold, God says to Zion, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. As I live, saith Yahweh, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all, as with an ornament, and bind them on thee as a bride doeth. For thy waste and thy desolate places and the land of thy destruction. So notice the language. There would come a time when God would have to put Zion aside. She would go into dispersion. Her people would go into dispersion. The events of AD 70, of course, are being foreshadowed here in the prophecy of Isaiah. 
That time would come. The Apostle Paul is preaching just prior to AD 70. And he quotes from this chapter so we know the context. We know why he's here. He's here in this context. He goes on to say this in verse 19. He says, The place, the land of thy destruction, shall even be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants. And they that swallowed thee up shall be far away. The children which thou shalt have, after thou hast lost the other, that is, their own natural children, shall say again in thine ears, The place is too straight for me, it's too narrow. Give place to me that I may dwell. What's this talking about? Well, it's talking about the Gentiles coming into the faith. And God would remove the Jews from the land in the events of AD 70. They would go into dispersion throughout all the nations of the earth and the gospel would go out to the Gentiles and they would come in in their multitudes so that Zion's tent wouldn't be big enough. Let's read on. Verse 21. Then shalt thou say in thine heart, Who hath begotten me these, seeing I have lost my children, her natural children, and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro. See, so her natural children have been put out of the land. Zion is in the time of her captivity. What's God doing when the Jews have fallen aside? Well, he's gathering a multitude of Gentiles into the Abrahamic faith. That's what he's doing. And that's what this section of Isaiah is all about. The servant prophecies. From here on, brothers and sisters, it never ceases. It's still there in Isaiah 66. You want to take a good read of this section. It's absolutely marvellous what God does here through the prophet Isaiah and sets forth the place that you and I occupy in his purpose. You know, you get a hint, don't you, when you read verse 22. Because Zion says at the end of verse 21, Who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. I was in dispersion. These, where have they been? Where have they come from? Next verse says, Gentiles. And that's where they do come from. So let's have a look at Isaiah 54 very quickly now because this is how the story flows on in this prophecy. Isaiah 54 verse 1. We know that 53 is about the sacrificial work of Christ. 54 verse 1 is quoted by the Apostle Paul, as you can see from your margin, in Galatians chapter 4 verse 27, in the context of the allegory, where he puts forth two women, Hagar and Sarah. Hagar represents, he says, Mount Sinai, the law of Moses, and her children, Ishmael, natural Jews, like Ishmael, circumcised in flesh, but not in heart, living under law, no hope of life. Sarah, who does she represent? The Abrahamic covenant, the new Jerusalem, the Jerusalem from above. Her children, born by the power of the Spirit, so to speak, by faith, eternal life. Absolute contrast between these two women. Paul quotes Isaiah 54, verse 1, to develop that allegory. He goes on to say, Sing, O barren, thou that dost not, did, didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, said Yahweh. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not. You need more room, Zion. You're going to get more and more children. And they will be cramming into your tent. Got the message? Verse 3. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. So who's the God at work here? Well, he's the God of verse 5 of Isaiah 54. For thy maker is thine husband. Yahweh of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. That's the one. That's why Isaiah 51, 55 verse 1 starts this way. Ho, everyone. Everyone? Yes. Jew and Gentile. That's why verses 4 and 5 are there in Isaiah 55. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the peoples. You can put an S on the end, that word people. It's plural. A leader and a commander to the peoples. He says this in verse 5. Behold, thou shalt call a nation, Zion, and thou, that thou knowest not. And this is how it should read. And a nation, not nations, a nation, it's singular, that knew not thee, shall run unto thee, 
because of Yahweh thy God, for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. So here is the context. So who is this nation that Isaiah refers to here? Well, we spent some time on this several weeks ago. If you come to Isaiah 65 verse 1, I'm not going to do too much of the mechanics of this. You can do it in your own time. I'm going to point out what's here. We read in Isaiah 65 and at verse 1, bearing in mind, as you can see from the screen, that the Apostle Paul quotes the first half of Isaiah 65 verse 1 in Romans 10.20 and he's talking about Gentiles being called to the faith. He doesn't quote the second half. He quotes the first half of Isaiah 65 verse 2 in Romans 10 verse 21, which is the next verse in Romans 10, about the Jews. Okay? He doesn't quote the second half. So it's a very fascinating way of presenting something. So we've got to intelligently look at these contexts and say, well, what's Paul on about here? What's the point he's trying to make? Well, it's not too hard to understand. You don't need to be Einstein to understand. You just need to read it. Isaiah 65 verse 1 I am sought of them that ask not for me I am, I am found of them that sought me not He's talking about Gentiles We know that from Romans 10.20 There's no argument about that Then we see this in Isaiah 65 verse 1 I said, behold me, behold me unto a nation That was not called by my name A nation? He doesn't say nations A nation he means the true Israel of God. The Ecclesia of which you and I are members. That's the nation he's talking about. He goes on to say in verse 2 here. I spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. Romans 10, 21 tells you who they are. The Jews. Which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts and it flows on to speak about their behaviour and why they would have to be put out of God's land and set aside like Paul says in Romans 11 they will be set aside for a time while the gospel goes to the Gentiles and the true Israel of God the one that the Apostle Paul refers to in, in Galatians 6 verse 12 is it Ephesians 6 verse 12 the Israel of God that he talks about it's that one brothers and sisters it's the one that Paul talks about in Hebrews 12, 22 and 23, when he says, you've not come to the mountain that might be touched, but you have come to Mount Zion. Who is it? Well, it's the Jerusalem, the Jerusalem from above, to an ecclesia of firstborns. This is the ecclesia that we belong to. It's the ecclesia formed on the basis of the Abrahamic promises. And so, brothers and sisters, this is the nation to which we're related. There's one passage here I do want you to turn up, and that's Matthew 21 and verse 43. Matthew 21 and verse 43. We know the parable of the vineyard. Who's the vineyard? Well, this right. That's Psalm 80, isn't it? Verse 8. God brought a vine out of Egypt. That's Isaiah chapter 5. So Israel was God's vineyard. Who were the keepers of it? Well, the leaders of the Jews in Christ's day, weren't they? And they're the ones called the husbandmen in this parable. And we read this, brothers and sisters, when he asked the question, verse 40, when the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what will he do to these husbandmen that have mistreated his servants, the prophets who came to him and took his son and killed him? What will he do to the husbandmen of the vineyard? Well, this is what he's going to do. Verse 41, even they condemn themselves. For they say unto him, he will miserably destroy these wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus then quotes Psalm 118. And then he says this in verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God, because that's what Israel was, wasn't it? The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. A nation? Where's he getting that from? Straight from Isaiah 55, verses 4 and 5. Isaiah 65, verse 1. And Deuteronomy 32, which is also quoted by Paul in Romans 10. You know what Paul says out of Deuteronomy? He says, 
I will provoke them to jealousy with a foolish nation. And that's what the Jews thought the Gentiles were. Foolish. A foolish nation. Nation? Yes. Same term. So the Lord Jesus Christ is saying that he would go to the Gentiles and they would respond. And the true ecclesia, the true Israel of God, would be formed by the work of his apostles. That's what he's saying. There's no way of escaping that conclusion. When you come back to Isaiah chapter 56, you read this in verses 3 to 8. You know, it's, the scripture speaks for itself, brothers and sisters. We do not need to impose our opinions on the Bible. It is its, its own expositor. And if you read it and compare it and put the picture together, you can sit down because it speaks for itself. Have a look at Isaiah chapter 56. It says this, in the wake of the things we've read in Isaiah 55, and of course there's a whole lot more than that. It says this in chapter 56 and at verse 3. Neither let the son of the stranger, the foreigner, that hath joined himself to Yahweh speak, saying, Yahweh hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. Verse 6. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to Yahweh to serve him, etc. And then verse 7. We have the words, of course, at the end of that verse about Yahweh's holy mountain and his temple. For mine house should be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And tomorrow afternoon, God willing, we will come to one of the most wonderful, beautiful jewels in the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ by enacted parables. We'll come to Mark chapter 12. It's absolutely awe-inspiring what our Lord does as he makes his way to the cross. He's going to incorporate Gentiles. He knows that. He knows the scriptures he's going to fulfil. This is one of them. Isaiah chapter 56. And then look at verse 8. Adonai Yahweh which gathereth the outcasts of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. He's talking about Gentiles. That's the context. So there we have all that we can really do on that matter. But I think it's pretty clear that you and I are in that privileged position of being part of that nation to whom the vineyard has been given. Brothers and sisters, let us rejoice in that as our fellow Gentiles in the past did. And here we're going to talk about a family with Gentile origin who rejoiced in their involvement in the promises made to Abraham. Can I take you back now to Genesis 15? Just one verse, because in our second study, later on today, we're coming back to have a bit of a closer look at Genesis 15. This is the fourth promise that God made to Abraham. And it ends this way with Yahweh cutting a covenant, which will also play a very important part later on today. He says this in verse 18, He cut a covenant with Abram, saying, And to thy seed have I given this land, etc. Then he spells it out. And then he tells us the people that have to be removed from this land in order that Abraham's seed, Christ, can inherit it. Who are they? Well, we read in verse 19, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites. And the first two tribes that are listed here in Genesis 15 verse 19 of the ten to be evicted from the land so that Christ could inherit it are going to be the subject of our first two studies today. In this session we're going to look at the Kenizzites. In our next session, God willing, we'll look at the Kenites. Similar names, totally different tribes. Some Kenites, as we shall see in our next study, God willing, namely the Rechabites, will have a permanent inheritance in the land, while many Jews, natural children of Abraham, will not. The most prominent Kenizzite in history will have a place beside Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the land of promise. His name was Caleb. And Caleb, of course, wanted Hebron. Now, where was Abraham living when the events of Genesis 14 and 15 took place? Well, you're told that at the end of chapter 13. He was at Hebron. What was Abraham doing at Hebron? Have a look at chapter 14 and verse 13. 
he puts together an army to pursue Kedileoma and says this, and there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, just take that little phrase on board because in our second study that we'll be coming back to that, for he dwelt by the oak of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, brother of Anah, and these were confederate with Abram. The words, Balaam, Bereth, rendered confederate, possessors, owners of a covenant with Abraham. So Abraham had converted many Gentiles. In the 20 years he spent at Hebron, he converted many Gentiles by the preaching of the Abrahamic promises. And they come into his ecclesia. He had ecclesia of probably a thousand people here at Hebron. Hebron means association, share, hence fellowship. So this is a very important place in the scheme of things. And it was the stumbling block to the ten spies of Numbers chapter 13. And amongst those ten spies, sorry, should I say, there were twelve spies, but ten of them were unfaithful. Amongst the twelve spies was Caleb and Joshua, the only two faithful. This was the stumbling block to the ten spies. However, the patriarchs and their wives were buried in a field nearby, in the cave of Machpelah. And that's why Caleb wanted it for his inheritance. We're going to see how this story develops in a moment. It was the only place in this entire land that he wanted for his inheritance. And we're going to see that in fact he didn't even get the city of Hebron and was quite happy about it. Perfectly happy about it. Now this is the story that's now in front of us. So who is this Caleb? Well Caleb's name means a dog from the root to yield or to attack. And the dog was the Jewish symbol for the Gentiles. The Lord Jesus Christ acknowledged that. It is not fit, he says, to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. He uses a gentler term than what we might expect. He uses the word for a puppy, to cast it to the puppies. And puppies were allowed inside, but mature, mature dogs were not. So the woman, the Canaanite woman, grabs hold of that and says, Yes, Lord, all I want is the crumbs. From under the table. He'd given her some crumbs and she grabbed them. We're going to see that she learnt that from people like Caleb. So here we've got a man whose name means a dog. He has obviously Gentile origins, because we're going to see in a moment he's called a Kenazite. Deliberately in the script, he's called a Kenazite. He's the son of Jephunneh, which means he will be prepared or he will be facing. Kenazite means a descendant of Kenaz, which means a hunter. And Caleb's prominent position in Judah, in fact he's, he's chosen as one of the twelve spies probably indicates his, an his ancestors had joined the patriarchal family somewhere in the land before Jacob came into Egypt. And we're not given any details about that, but we are given details about his origins. Come with me to Numbers chapter 32. Now again, we won't be spending a lot of time here, but just pick up the threads. And the way the scripture presents this man, Numbers 32, <coughs> We read this in verse 6. This is about the Reubenites and the Gadites requesting that they might remain on the east of Jordan. And Moses upbraids them and says, Now listen, don't you remember the history of the spies that came into the land and came back with an evil report? Don't you remember that? Do you want to discourage your brethren? Now, he might have been, been a bit tough on them, but the fact is he's reminding them of the dreadful disaster of the twelve spies returning with a faithless report. So he goes on to say that. And when he comes to verse 12, he says this. That's verse 11. Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward, so he's recounting the condemnation of the older generation in Numbers chapter 14, shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac and Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite. I wonder why God puts that in there. The Kenazite. And Joshua the son of Nun. They've wholly followed me. Let's come to Joshua chapter 14. Let's just follow this theme of the Kenazite. Joshua chapter 14. Again, I'm not going to read the whole context. From verses 6 to 15. Just to highlight a couple of things. This is where, where Caleb comes before Joshua. He's now 85 years of age. 
They've spent seven years conquering the land. The time has come to take their inheritance personally. And Caleb comes to Joshua and says, I want my inheritance. And what I want is Hebron. Verse 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him. And so he goes on to tell his story and to make his request. And verse 13 says this. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed Yahweh, God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, which means the city of the four, and the four, of course, of the giants, Anak and his three sons. There was a great man there, Anak, and he had these three sons. We'll talk a bit more about them in a moment. So you've got a picture? Twice in that account, Yahweh says that Caleb's the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. I wonder why the emphasis is like this. Well, let's come now to Joshua chapter 21. Joshua 21. The time has come to give the Levites, beginning with the family of Aaron, an inheritance in the land. We read in verse 9 that they gave their inheritance to Judah. And then we read this in verse 10. Which the children of Aaron, being of the families of the Kohathites, who were of the children of Levi, had, for theirs was the first lot. And they gave them the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah, with the suburbs thereof round about it. But the fields of the city and the villages thereof gave they to Caleb the son of Jephunneh for his possession. Now brothers and sisters, what's happened here is this. As we're going to find in a moment, we come to Judges chapter 1. It was Caleb that came to Hebron and took it from the Anakims. Those men who had been a stumbling block to his brothers 45 years before. He puts them out of business. He takes possession of the city, but he doesn't move his furniture in. He does not move his furniture in. Because the next thing that happens is that Joshua draws lots and the family of Aaron is given the city of Hebron. And you know what happened when they gave the city to the Levites. The Levites took possession of the whole city and the immediate area around the walls, right? Caleb was not upset by that. Here's the man who had devoted his whole life to take this place which had been a stumbling block to his brothers and caused so much pain and heartache for his people had spent 38 years wandering aimlessly until probably close to 2 million of them perished in the wilderness. Look at all the heartache and the pain. And he comes to Joshua and says, Give me that place! That was the cause of the problem. Give me that place. Can't wait to lay his hands on the Anakims and get rid of them. And they say, now Caleb, this city is given to the sons of Aaron. You think he might be a bit upset about that, eh? Not in the slightest. You know why? Because he only wants one field. He just wants one field. That's the field referred to in verse 12. The fields of the city and the villages thereof gave they to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for his possession. Because in one of those fields, brothers and sisters, was the cave of Machpelah, where Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Leah were laid to rest. And that's where Caleb wanted to be laid to rest because when the resurrection comes, Caleb wanted to be raised from the dead right alongside Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and their respective wives. And it's going to be a surprise, isn't it, for Abraham? When Abraham's woken up by the angels very shortly and he stands up and he's got Sarah beside him and there's Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Leah. You look at this man and say, Who are you? <laughs> Where did you come from? 
I'm Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite. Who? Who did you say you were? Kenazite? I can remember what God said to me in Genesis 15, verses 18 to 21, when he made his fourth promise to me. He said that the peoples that had to be removed from the land that my seed Christ could inherit it were Kenites. And Kenazites, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And Caleb will say to him, I'm here because I've got your faith. I believe the same promises that you believed. I might be a Kenazite, but I'm going to inherit with you, Abraham. Isn't that a marvellous thing? It's one of the great paradoxes of the Bible, isn't it? That God says, I'm going to put these people out. That Christ and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob can inherit the land. But when that land is inherited, there'll be Kenazites and Kenites there. That's how Yahweh works, brothers and sisters. Right back there in the history of Israel, he was saying to you and me, you can share equally with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, regardless of your origins. Got to be on the basis of the Abrahamic faith. Isn't that a wonderful story? Well, it doesn't stop there. I want you to come down to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 1. Because you might recall that this study was entitled The Family of Caleb, not just Caleb. We want to talk about the family of Caleb. Now most of us, I think, are quite familiar with the structure of the book of Judges. It's divided up into, into three parts. There is chapter 1, verse 1, to 3, verse 6, which speaks about the failure of Israel to, to consolidate their inheritance. There is chapter 3, verse 7, to 16, verse 31, the end of the story of Samson, which is about the history of Israel and the Judges. And then there's the appendices, the two appendices to the book which, by the way, sit between verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2. So chronologically, these appendices here sit up in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Okay? So that's, that's another story. But all I want to do is just give you a framework of the book of Judges and then to show you how curiously it begins. It's a very curious beginning to a book. It says this in verse 1. Now after the death of Joshua it came to pass that the children of Israel asked Yahweh saying who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? Can I just direct your attention to chapter 2 verse 6? Chapter 2 verse 6 says this And when Je Joshua had let the people go jo Joshua? I thought he died. I thought it says in chapter 1 verse 1 that he was dead. But in chapter 2, verse 6, he's alive. Hey, you ever wondered about that? It's a very curious beginning, and there's a reason for it. Because you see, straight up front, brothers and sisters, straight up front, God's going to point to two basic misconceptions that his people had when they came to inherit the land. They didn't understand what God was doing with them. They didn't appreciate the things that have been accomplished through Joshua. So they ask two questions. Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites? First, to fight against them. Well, they were wrong on both counts. Israel was totally incorrect on two counts. Responsibility was given to every man to go up and seize his inheritance. So just have a look at Joshua 24, verse 28 just uh, over the page Joshua 24 28 says so Joshua let the people depart every man unto his inheritance have a look at chapter 2 of Judges and verse 6 again and when Joshua had let the people go the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land and there was the principle brothers and sisters Joshua, Yahshua, Jesus had done all that Yahweh said he should do. He could do no more than what he had done. And our Lord Jesus Christ could do no more than what he has done. And now it's up to every man. 
to go out and to seize their inheritance in the land of promise because what stood between them and that land was Canaanites no longer any organised resistance just individual Canaanites sitting in their inheritance guess what I've got brothers and sisters I've got a Canaanite sitting in my inheritance he's right here I'm going to talk about him in a moment he's right here and he stands between me and eternal life in the kingdom of God and you've got one too Christ can do no more Yahweh can do no more through our Lord Jesus Christ than what has been done now it's up to every man to go and seize his inheritance that's the principle I didn't understand and the second one was this that Yahweh had already gone up first to destroy organised resistance Joshua 21 tells us that verses 43 to 45 he could have done no more brothers and sisters those two things are essential if we want life in the kingdom of God and inheritance in that land we have to understand these can you, can you see the exasperation on God's face when his people come to him and say who shall go up for us first oh goodness. what have I got to do he did not understand do we understand we appreciate the principles involved in obtaining inheritance. Caleb did, and so did his family. We're going to see that in a moment. Now, what about these Canaanites? Well, the land was full of Canaanites. Verse 1 says, against the Canaanites first. This word karnat, or the root karnat, means to bend the knee, hence to humiliate or vanquish, hence to humble, to be humbled, etc. It's very important in the scheme of things because the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3.21 in the context of the change of our nature by Christ at his coming he says who shall transform the body of our humiliation this is Young's literal translation as you can see so Christ is coming he says and he's going to transform the body of your humiliation you could read the body of the Canaanite <coughs> because that's what Canaan means I don't know about you, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. The body I possess in common with Adam is a body that humiliates me. And it does that in many different ways. It humiliates me by sin. It humiliates me by sickness and disease. It humiliates me by the loss of vigour and youthfulness. All sorts of ways I'm humiliated by the nature I bear. It is a body of humiliation. And the final humiliation would be that you die and they put you in a box and bury you six foot underground. Utterly humiliated. And that's what Christ is coming to change. He's going to give us a body like unto his glorious body. And finally, the Canaanite will be displaced from our inheritance. Won't that be a fabulous day? That's what this story is about. So why would you want to ask, who should go up for us? First. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous, isn't it? Brothers and sisters, these are the principles. So God in his exasperation says, Judah should go up. Why would he choose Judah? Well, because it has a family in it. A faithful family, about whom we're going to read shortly. The family of Caleb. That's why. But Judah makes a fatal mistake. Have a look at the record. Verse 4. Judah went up. Yahweh delivers the Canaanites into their hand and the Perizzites. And they slew them in Bezek, 10,000. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek. And they fought against him and they slew the Canaanites. But not Adonai Bezek. Verse 6. He fled. They caught him. And when they caught him, they cut off his thumbs and his great toes. Because that's what he used to do to others. Verse 7. Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table. As I have done, so God hath requited me. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. As we're going to see in a moment. This, brothers and sisters, the failure of Judah to deal with Adonai Bezek is the first case in the Bible of national Judaism. National Judaism. How? 
Well, this man of Don Ibizek means the Lord of Lightning, the Master of Lightning. We're going to see in a moment that they dealt with his hands and his feet, but they did not deal with his brain. And that cost them the vision of peace. Now you and I have a problem. I know I've got a problem. I have a relatively quick mind, I think. It's getting slower as I get older. A relatively quick mind, but I tell you not, but this is something that I have learned to my cost over and over again, brothers and sisters and young people. Listen to this. My mind is slow when it comes to spiritual things. Very slow. But it's like lightning. Absolutely like greased lightning when it comes to carnal things. It's so quick. And I can be walking along quite harmlessly and all of a sudden I see something and vroom, like a flash of lightning, my brain is somewhere where it oughtn't to be. You like that? Or am I a stranger here? I got any friends in this hall? Oh, I think I've got a few. So this is the Lord, the master of lightning. We're going to see what happens here. He's king of Canaanites, king of sin, king of humiliation, this man. He's humiliated other captives by amputating parts of their body. So Judah does the same to him. They cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Adonai Bezek thought that this was God's revenge. But it wasn't. Because Yahweh had made it quite clear what they should do to the Canaanites. And in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 15 and 16, Yahweh said, you'll kill every one of them. Man, woman, and child. You will not leave one of them alive. Why? Because Canaanites will not inherit the kingdom of God. And if you get to the judgment seat and the Canaanites in charge of your life, watch out. You won't be going to the kingdom. That's the principle God establishes. This is the king of humiliation, king sin. You're going to deal with him. You know, don't just cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Because his mind was left to contrive and to scheme. And Jerusalem was finally lost. You have a look at verse 7 of Judges 1. So they cut off his toes and his, his, uh, his thumbs. And he says, so God has requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem. Jerusalem means the vision of peace. And there he died, but not before he had organised a rebellion. Look at verse 21 of Judges 1. Now what Judah did is they gave, because Jerusalem was on the border of Judah and Benjamin, they gave Jerusalem initially to the Benjamites, saying, here, you have Jerusalem. Verse 21 says, and the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But I thought it had just been captured. Yeah, it was. Judah captured it. And they took a Don Ibizek there. And then Judah says, here Benjamin, you have it. Let me read in verse 21. It's in the hands of Jebusites. How come? Well, because of the brain. The brain of a Don Ibizek. He kept on, he didn't have any way of doing anything. He couldn't work. He couldn't walk. But his brain was at work. And it conceived the idea, ultimately, of overthrowing the Benjamites. And Israel lost a vision of peace. That's a very real warning, isn't it? Brothers and sisters, beware of Judaism. Beware of it. Judaism is about touch not, taste not, handle not. Don't go here, don't go there. It's about cutting off thumbs. You cut your thumb off. You can't do anything. You can't work. There's no way you can use your hands to work. You cut your big toes off, you'll fall over. You can't stand up, you can't walk. Judaism is about dealing with the externals. Touch not. Touch not. Handle not. Don't walk here. Don't walk there. And does nothing. Nothing about the brain. And then that's what the Lord Jesus Christ encountered when he came. You know, people that were governed by laws, extrapolated law. But their brain was corrupt. That's where you've got to start. You've got to start with what's up here in the cranium. 
That's how you deal with your works and your walk. You get this right, you'll do the right thing. And you'll walk in the right way. So don't ever be trapped by Judaism. <coughs> now let's come to Hebron. Judges chapter 1 verse 9 we read this. And after the children of Israel, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain. And they come to Hebron in verse 10. Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron before was Kerjath Arba, the city of the four, that is the four giants, Anak and his three sons. And they slew Sheshai and Ahaman and Talmai. So who is this Anak and his three sons? Well, Hebron, as we saw, means association or fellowship. Before you can have that, you've got to deal with its original inhabitants. You're not going to have fellowship with God until you deal with the four giants. That's the principle being expressed here. Herjaf Arba, city of the four giants. But who are the three sons of this giant, <coughs> Anak? Well, Sheshai means whitish, like leprosy. Hitchcock says it means six. Very appropriate, because six is the number of flesh. So Sheshai is the lust of the flesh. He's got a brother. Ahama, whose name means my brother is a gift. Gift? Yes, we know from the proverb that a gift blinds the eyes. The lust of the eyes. And he's not another brother. Telma means rich. From the root meaning to accumulate. You know like you do with your snow? You know, it snows and you get out there with a shovel or a plough and you accumulate. You want to go to Newfoundland to St John's. 12 feet high, as high as the ceiling, in their front yards. You couldn't believe it. This rich stuff, pushed up. Sounds to me like the pride of life. Doesn't it? Puffed up. So here they are, brothers and sisters. The giant is King Sin. And he has three sons who do his bidding in the arena of the Canaanite. Here's my Canaanite. And the three sons of Anak are lodged in him. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes. <coughs> and the pride of life. What's Caleb going to do to this mob? He's going to destroy him. First John 2, 16, there it is. For all is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's our problem, isn't it? That's what stands between us and eternal life what Caleb is going to do with these giants. And that's exactly what he does. It says in verse 10 that he went against and he slew Sheshai and Ahamah and Talmai that he might have fellowship with God. Verse 11. From thence he went against the inhabitants of Debur and the name of Debur before was Kerjath Sefer. Another place that's very important. So Hebron is taken here. And the next city that's taken is this one here. Deber. Now this city is first called Kerjath Sefa, which just happens to mean the city of a book or book town. It's renamed Deber, which means the shrine or the innermost part of the sanctuary. This place, brothers and sisters, is a type of Jerusalem in two eras of time. Right now, Jerusalem is the city of the book, is it not? What will it be tomorrow? What will Jerusalem be when Christ is there? It will be the shrine, the innermost part of the divine sanctuary. Mount Zion will be surrounded by a circular sanctuary and that will contain the most holy place of the kingdom age. That's what Jerusalem will be tomorrow. So this city is a typical city. And it's taken by Othniel. Let's just read this record again. In verse 12, Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerjath Sefa and taketh it, to him will I give Aksar my daughter to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, in fact his nephew, took it. And he gave him Aksar, his daughter, to wife. So who is this Othniel? Well, one thing we know, he's of the tribe of Judah. Caleb and Othniel are of Judah. And his name means the Lion of God. 
according to Jesenius. He's the Lion of God from the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5, verses 1 to 6. You know what that says, don't you? So here we have a man who's a type of Christ. He happens to be, of course, Israel's first judge. Caleb's nephew. The first judge of Israel in the period of the judges. Isn't that interesting that he should be a type of our Lord Jesus Christ? That he should take a city known as the city of the book and receive as his prize that he might display her in that place a woman called Aksar who's clearly a type of the bride of Christ. He judges Israel for 40 years, which we're going to see as typical of the millennial age in a moment, and he marries this woman, Aksa. Her name means anklet, from a root of fetter around the ankle. Now that means she was a slave. That's what you did to slaves. You put an anklet, a fetter on them, and chain them together. It's exactly what we are, brothers and sisters. Did you know that I'm actually chained to you? You don't like that, do you? You don't want me chained to you. But I am. Because I'm a slave. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Like Paul was a slave of Jesus Christ. And so are you. And just like they used to chain slaves together and they would march off somewhere, so we are chained together, so to speak. We're all bond slaves of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're part, too, of the Bride of Christ. She's the daughter of Caleb, whose name means a dog, the Jewish symbol of the Gentiles. <coughs> She's a Kenazite, like Caleb's a Kenazite. She's his daughter. She comes from the tribe mentioned in Genesis 15, verse 19, that has to be removed from the land so that Christ can inherit it. Caleb's family must have attached themselves, as we said before, Sometime in Israel's previous history. We don't know. Because he did become a ruler of Judah. But he has Gentile origins. So what does that make his daughter? Caleb probably married a woman of Judah. So Caleb's daughter is both Jewish and Gentile in her origins. And so will be the bride of Christ. Whom he will display in the sanctuary of Yahweh in the house of prayer for all nations he will show his bride to the world 50 years after he's come to raise her from the dead and to gather those that are alive and remain he'll walk his bride around the house part Jew part Gentile what a story that is and this woman is there she is there in the story because of her attitude to water have a look at verse 14 and it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father, not a field, there's an article in the Hebrew, the field. There was only one field. She was interested. She wasn't going to be a farmer. She was going to raise a family. And she knew that if you're going to raise a family in a dry land, and this was the Negev, Negev means parched, okay, you have to have water. So we read what she does. She got down off the donkey, the ass, the camor, the symbol of Israel. She prostrated herself before her father. She made a request. Give me a blessing. Give me a blessing. But thou hast given me a south land. The word south is the word. Negev. Means parched. A parched land. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. She takes the initiative to request from her father the field near Deber, the shrine. She'd already spied out the land. She equated a blessing with the supply of water in a dry land. Is that your attitude, brothers and sisters? Do you think that the greatest blessing that you can have is to sit around with your brothers and sisters around the word of God or privately at home when the rest of the world's carrying on? as though Christ would never come? Do you regard that as the greatest blessing in your life? She did. Give me a blessing. I want water. The water of the Word of God. 
So she's given the upper springs and the lower springs. And I believe that's a reference to the simplicities of the word of God and to its profundities. The whole range, the simple things to the profundities, the upper and the lower. Now let's finish off this story, shall we? Very quickly. Come to Judges chapter 3. Because that's not the last thing that Othniel does. Chapter 3, verse 8, we read this. Therefore the anger of Yahweh was hot against Israel because they turned aside and married into the world and hadn't killed the Canaanites. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan, Cushan Rishathaim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto Yahweh, he raised them up a Yasha, a saviour, to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the lion of God, of the tribe of Judah, son of Kenaz, Caleb's nephew. And the spirit of Yahweh came upon him, and he judged Israel. That word came upon in verse 10 is hayah. It means to exist. Hence to become. So Othniel becomes a spirit man. So here he is. He's a spirit man. The Lion of God from the tribe of Judah. And he's going to deliver his people from the hand of Cushan Rishathaim. Now Cushan Rishathaim comes from this area. From Mesopotamia. The high land between the two rivers. And he comes into the land and he oppresses Israel. Who is this Cushan Rishathaim? Well, his name means Cush of double wickedness. Who's Cush? Well, he's king of Mesopotamia, the area of ancient Babylon, the original Cush of the Bible, Genesis 2 verse 13 and 10 verse 10. It was called Cush, this area, in history. This is where the kingdom of men was first established. And the founder of the kingdom of men was Nimrod. And Nimrod's father was Cush. And Cush was the great original prophet of the Babylonian mysteries from which the doctrines of the Catholic Church came. And who will the lion of the tribe of Judah have to destroy in order to redeem his people Israel from the hand of their oppressor? Oh, it's obvious, isn't it? Babylon the Great. It's the work of Elijah bringing the Jews back through the wilderness of the peoples over 40 years in the second exodus for the destruction of Babylon the Great. Who destroys them? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Who's he got in his company? Aksa, his bride, consisting of Jew and Gentile. Cushan Rishathaim is clearly a type of Babylon the Great in its final manifestation in opposition to the rule of Christ. The story of Revelation 17 and 18 and 19. And Othniel's triumph over Cushan Rishathaim, this Cush of double wickedness. Why double wickedness, do you think? Why is Cush doubly wicked? Well, because, you see, he's both a religious power and a military oppressor. A Cush of double wickedness. Christ and the saints will defeat him, just like Othniel did. And as the record says in verse 11, he gave the land rest 40 years, a probation period, the millennial period. Brothers and sisters, let us strive to have the faith of the family of Caleb.